Thank you, everyone. Thank you. I am so excited to be here uh, and to be part of this, uh, this uh, community. This is really actually my first time, so I'm excited already for that. But then I'm, of course, excited that I get to talk about my favorite subject, which isn't always the favorite subject of everybody in general. <laughs> Death. Well, um, like uh, Annika was saying, I'm doing my PhD in the University of Helsinki about uh, modern death in Finland. Um, there's a story behind how I ended up doing that research. Uh, I'm not going to go into that story right now because I have so many things I want to share with you, so I actually start talking about my research right from the beginning. Um, I was really, uh, I have a background in anthropology and uh, I've done field work in, in different parts of the world. So I really wanted to do ethnographic research among dying people. How do contemporary Finnish uh, urban Helsinki Leinen, who are mostly quite secular, how do they face death and dying today? And especially in a situation when they have been given the diagnosis of terminal illness. Serious situation. Um, so I ended up doing field work uh, in Terhokoti Hospice, which is here in Helsinki, and also in the cancer clinic of uh, the university hospital, and met with a number of patients, of whom maybe around 20, 25, 30, became closer to me, and some of them I followed their, throughout their whole uh, last chapter of their life, whether it was about days, weeks, or months. So my main question was really, um, I, I was wondering, just a few decades ago, like you all know, uh, Lutheran Christianity was really quite strong still in Finland. It was a very homogeneous culture with a, with a Lutheran worldview, which really, uh, even though it wasn't maybe outwardly so uh, strongly expressed, there were internal views that people, people held throughout their lives. And death and dying, of course, had a special place in, in the Christian system, so to say. And now we are living in a different time. The Christianity and the, the Christian worldview, the language, the imageries, they don't really reach people any longer, or at least urban, uh, younger generations. Um, so I was wondering if we, decades ago, we had uh, certain language and certain imagery that we could deal with, deal death with. We could use as tools those words and, and, and images. But now if those don't exist any longer, how do people deal with these things? What kind of language they use? Are there still any rituals or, or something or how, what are the tools people can use? So these were the questions I, I, I wanted to find out uh, some an answers to, and so I went to the field with these questions. Well, just to say something about the general situation in the Western culture. Uh, there seems to be a kind of an interesting tension uh, when we think of death in the Western culture. In one hand, we are still seeking immortality, not any longer with the help of religion, which used to be the, the sphere of immortality, eternal life, the, the institution that guaranteed everybody eternal life. Now, religion doesn't do that for us, it doesn't work for us any longer, but what could do that? Science, right? So the image there on the upper left, uh, do you know what those are, those tanks? Some of you know? They are uh, cryonic tanks. Uh, cryogenic technology is a technology where you deep freeze the deceased body into the temperature of 196 minus 196 Celsius. And the idea is that, uh, you know, the companies that offer this service, they freeze the body or sometimes just the head. I guess it's cheaper because it's rather expensive <laughs> service, you can imagine. Um, so they freeze the body or the, the, the head uh, so long that uh, there is this uh, idea that science will advance and technology will advance and one day we are able to reanimate the bodies and revive the people and thus they will have their eternal life. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> this is one idea. So then it's very interesting that we have simultaneously completely different kind of idea which is this. Euthanasia, 
which is very acute actually right now in Finland. Right as we speak, the parliament or some sort of a, a, a lautakunta, what is it, a board, special board inside of parliament is preparing a, a proposal for legislation that whether euthanasia could be possible in Finland. There's a strong debate about it. Lots of general public are very uh, pro-euthanasia. What is euthanasia about? It's about quick exit, fast, swift, and, you know, controlled and very different, you know, wa wanting to die. Very different idea. Eternal life, quick death. But what is common between these two, interestingly, is the control, right? We need to have control. We want to have control. Whether it's control about life or control about death. So this is the general picture. And what was interesting, that in some ways, we can see reflections of this in my own research in the field among the ordinary Finns who are not, I've never heard anybody dreaming of cryonics really, but uh, there's different issues that come up. So I was asking myself, how do people face death and dying? Well, many of them actually don't. They are running away from the death. Even in situations where a person is very, very ill, they have been, they, they are actively dying. They may be still, uh, you know, in, in, in some decades ago, they, they talked about denial of death. Maybe it's that, but it's also not just uh, denying the dying, but they are obsessively focusing on, on extension of life. And they are doing all kinds of things in order to achieve more time, more life, to stay here in this world. That's one thing about our time and our culture. We are very this-worldly. That's why it's really hard to think of death, because we don't have the other world, other side. What is that? Like what? I mean, it's all about here. So I found something, what I call rituals for avoiding death. People were doing things. One of them is sports. There was one man, one, one, uh, I call them my patients, research participants officially, but one of my patients, he was a man about my age, and uh, uh, he had tumor in his uh, brain and, and uh, elsewhere also. He was definitely dying, but he was still capable of moving around. And he seemed to have this belief that as long as he keeps eating healthily, takes his vitamins, and every week does his sport, he cannot die. You know, his body cannot leave him cannot fail him, but he will survive. What happened? He actually, um, in the end, he actually died when he was walking back from the gym. You know, in a, in a way, somehow, he, he, he uh, manifested, he did what he kind of wanted, although he didn't succeed in the uh, eternal life part. But then some people do, somehow, uh, so, uh, they succeed to, uh, to face death, to become somehow okay with the idea that they are going to be dying. Oh, they are dying. And, and those were interesting, uh, interesting uh, people. How did these people uh, come about to this, this uh, uh, acceptance or, or um, how did they come to terms with their own situation? Now, Obviously, there is still people who can get relief from religion, but that's really quite minority. What I found was something uh, quite interesting. Um, there were other means than religion, but means that have something, somehow something similar than what religion can offer to us. And this is something that I call aesthetics or aesthetic experiences. I was told by a number of patients, I was told about special moments when they had somehow realized their situation or they had realized their, um, uh, in a, in a, somehow in a metaphysical way, they had come to this realization that, oh, I'm going to die. Or maybe it was the idea of the death, but also at the same time there was some sort of a, maybe a consolation or something about the situation that, um, it's okay also that I'm going to die. I will tell you a story that will uh, maybe explain a little bit about this. 
I had this one patient, uh, I call her Heidi. Uh, she was maybe 55 or something like that. And she was already in Terhokoti in the ward, uh, bed bound, uh, immobile, really close to death. Cancer was everywhere in her body. But she was still very alert in her mind and she wanted to speak with me. She was always very happy to meet me and share her thoughts. So we were ending up one of our conversations one morning and I was just about to leave the room um, and then she called me back, Maya, come back, I wanna share something with you, just in case we don't, you know, if we don't meet any lo anymore. She knew that she was dying very soon. So then she, she started telling me this story. A Couple years before, when she was already ill, uh, she was taking care of her grandson, who was maybe around four, and she was putting him down for a nap. And suddenly she heard a noise, some, some weird noise from outside. So she came downstairs and she went by the window to look outside uh, from the window. It was winter, there was snow on the ground, and there was two birds outside. There was a hawk and there was a black bird, mustarastas in Finnish. And what was going on? The hawk was eating the black bird. There was blood, there were black feathers all around the white snow, and she was looking at the scenery that was framed by the window. And she told me, quite brutal scene, I thought, but she told me, when I looked at this scene, I felt, I thought, I imagined that I, myself, I was the blackbird and I'm eating by the hawk. And I was so relieved and so happy that I'm gonna be going back to the nature, that I'm part of this cycle. I'm gonna be going back to the nature. And, and then I knew it's gonna be okay. So, I was perplexed when she told me this story. It, it was so, so strong and seemingly really important story for her because these were actually the last words that she was able to speak to me. I met her a few times after that, but she was already, she couldn't speak any longer. So I was perplexed, you know, what was going on? What, what, what happened here? And then I started thinking and I realized that there were few or b m more, um, not similar stories, but, well, similar stories in the sense that they were about sensory experiences. Whether it was about music that they heard, maybe just spontaneously by hazard, or that maybe, maybe they were listening to something. Maybe people were reading poetry, a novel, something. Sometimes people were writing themselves. People were in the nature. Something aesthetic happened which made them realize where they were. And what I think, uh, why it was so, uh, or why aesthetics? Like, uh, then this made me think, what's going on here? Like, what happens with the aesthetics or with art that can give people this sort of realization? I put this picture, this is uh, the National Library of Finland. If you haven't visited it, you should. It's a really beautiful place. Um, I tell you a bit later why I put this picture there. So what I think, what happens in these moments, and what's the power of art here? It, it, I think it has to do um, with virtuality. Susan Langer, who is a philosopher of art, or philosopher uh, in general, she has said that uh, art gives us virtual place, virtual space, and virtual time. And this virtual space enables us, it kind of empowers us to open up for possibilities. And unlike religion that claims different things on, or, or give you truths or uh, argues for certain dogmas, tells you how things are in this life, art doesn't do that. Art may give you suggestions uh, many about many truths, perhaps, but but it does, it does somehow open up this possibility which many of us, we've kind of lost the sense of, you know, otherworldliness, that is there something else. Art seems to open that possibility that maybe, if you wish, if you wanna take that leap, and that's the interesting thing, you are the one who's gonna make the last creation of that thought. You fill the last gap. Art or aesthetic experience can give you a suggestion or a hint or a feeling or an idea, but you're the one who will 
finalize the, the uh, sentence or finish the sentence, so to say. And then it's up to you what kind of a world you want to see, right? So I put this picture because one of my research patients, she actually, um, it's a long story, but she was actually, in the end, she was writing about her own death. And it was really hard for her. It was really, really hard. She, she, she had been with this, with this booklet for months, and she couldn't start. The last weeks, and she knew that it was coming closer, she, she kind of had to do something about it. She went to the National Library because she felt that it was so uplifting. And she did say, I asked her, she was texting me, she was in the library, and she took a photo and she sent it to me. I was in the university, she was texting. Here I am now writing, this is so beautiful. And I asked her, so what do you mean beautiful? Do you feel that, could you say sublime? I mean, we don't ever use that word any longer, right? And she said, yeah, I think that's what it is. It's somehow sublime, you know, what I feel here. So she was able to write in this environment. It that wouldn't probably work for everybody, but for her it did. For some other people, it would be this kind of a place. Um, so, about writing, maybe I want to, if I have time, I, there's a little quote, because writing, do I have time? What is the situation here? I'm fine. I'm fine? You know, a lot of young people actually do, uh, younger or older, they do uh, keep blog uh, when they are ill and also when they are dying. And um, one patient of mine who was actually also a friend of mine who died a couple years ago, she was writing a blog um, and she really wrote until the very end of her days. And I would like to write, uh, read you just a little quote how she, what she wrote. Because this, makes, this maybe explains a little bit what you can do, uh, yeah, what you do with creativity. I don't care. I'm not able to hear about my blood, my liver, my bones, my lungs, anything anymore. If I don't hear about them, is everything then fine? If I write my day to start in such a way that there are no more examinations whatsoever at all, may I then be happy? for just one single day? Would everything be different if I could be safe even in my dream, in my sleep? Sun, Aurinko, in the sky. Sun, my friend, help me to write about beautiful things. I can write myself exactly the kind of day I want. Look, a tree. Look, a bird. Look, a human. And she did write. She kind of defined her own deathscape, we could say, Kuoleman Maisema. She defined the space where she died. I don't know how I am time wise. I can talk more or I can. Five minutes? Okay, well, maybe then I can share some more uh, examples with you, right? Um, hmm, let's see where I would go from here. I was so worried that I didn't have enough time, so I guess I was, I was talking really fast. <laughs> hmm. Well, yes, let me tell about this one. So these were all very vari varied stories, different, different kind of stories. And it did take me a while to understand that the, the common, common nominator was, and I wouldn't call art, because some of them, like in the case of the, the black bird, it wasn't art, it was something else. It was a sensory experience, but it was really aesthetics. I ended up talking about aesthetic experience. That was the best I can do. You can give me some other ideas if you have. I know many of you work with art or, or with creativity. But one example was uh, this uh, about 60-year-old man who was, um, at that moment, he wasn't definite yet that he has cancer, but it was rather uh, uh, quite sure. And he was just going to go to the hospital to hear the results of his tests. And he was sitting in a car, driving, and uh, the radio was on, and he was in the, in the uh, traffic lights. And suddenly, this piece of classical music came on. He had never heard it before. And the music suddenly uh, took him away from the car and put him on the green fields, this man did have a religious uh, background. 
But it wasn't the religion, it was the music that took him, put him on the green fields. He saw himself literally in paradise. And he felt, okay, whatever happens, maybe it's cancer, maybe it's not, maybe I will die, but whatever happens, I, th I know now that I'm going to be okay. And then she came back the, uh, he came back to the car and, and, and continued to the hospital. So what happened there? Again, music as an aesthetic component created another kind of, I mean, it was vision really what he, he, he saw. And then it kind of resolved the anxiety that he had. So what happens in this situation? It, it seems to me that, that uh, the aesthetic moments or the art, art brings together things that otherwise cannot really be together in one frame. Being and non-being, paradoxes, really. Uh, time, no time, or eternity. These things that we have really hard time in our life, this worldliness, that worldliness. W what are we even talking about? But somehow art brings these things together and we are able, we cannot speak about these things very easily. So imagine I'm trying to write my dissertation, you know. So we can hardly, I mean it's hard to talk, that's why we have art. Art does it, it brings these things together and, and it's, it's like a frame that makes these otherwise impossible things possible. Okay. Maybe that's it. <laughs>